Vice Admiral Grig Griggs, uh, Chief of Navy, Lieutenant General Morrison, Chief of Army, uh, Vi Vice Admiral Ritchie uh, retired, uh, I'm not sure if he's with us today, but uh, Chairman of the Maritime Australia, to our visiting service chiefs and all their representatives and other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to address what promises to be another outstanding Royal Australian Navy Sea Power Conference. Please uh, let me first pass on the apologies from the Chief of Air Force, Air Marshal Jeff Brown, uh, and his very best wishes and indeed congratulations for the uh, International Fleet Review and 100 years of fleet. My Chief is engaged in some uh, important air diplomacy of his own in the West at the moment uh, to ensure that well-established practice of regional air engagement is furthered at every opportunity. Let me also note that uh, the Chief of Navy uh, gave me a little word of encouragement and advice prior to speaking to you this morning and he said your job should be quite simple and won't take long all you'll have to say is 100 JSF. Um, I hadn't intended actually using that but uh, um, and I'm sure under future analysis it'll become self-evident as to the requirement that we really need but I I do thank the Chief of Navy for that uh, assistance and, uh, and I'm pleased to note that he finally is starting to get it. Uh, please also uh, let me add my sincere congratulations to, to Vice Admiral Griggs and his staff uh, on this conference. I'm sure that this will prove to be a very stimulating few days. Uh, the presentation and the exhibition certainly um, very timely and also an important opportunity. I'll also add my own congratulations to the Royal Australian Navy, uh, to the men and women, um, as the Chief of Army has said, for a splendid turnout in the harbour this week, uh, this weekend, and uh, certainly I had the privilege of attending most of those events. Um, it's been a magnificent uh, fleet review and has been truly spectacular, so congratulations. I'm very pleased to represent the Chief of Air Force here today and to say a few words about the utility of Australian air power, and that is the air power provided by the Royal Australian Air Force in military diplomacy and power protection in what has been referred to as the maritime century. First though, regarding the topic of this conference, it goes without saying that navies provide enormous utility in the maritime century. Naval diplomacy and the ability of navies to project power across the maritime domain are in my view two of the key planks of the Australian national security strategy and policy. Our ability to shape and influence our security environment is fundamentally premised on our ability to interact with and shape our maritime domain. And navies remain the prime means of doing so. Army and Air Force, of course, have vital roles to play in this strategy, but the overriding consideration is, is that we live, engage, and operate in a maritime context. I've also noted in the booklet that's been provided with this conference program, a reference to the fact that the 21st century has been described as a maritime century as much as it is an Asian century. Due to the pervasive nature of global sea trade and the predominantly maritime environment of the Indo-Pacific region. I think we only need to look across the harbour to see ample evidence that the critical importance of the maritime environment is not lost on those countries with the capacity to engage in commerce, trade and diplomacy across the waves. If indeed we are in the early years of an Asian century, and for Australia we, we most certainly recognise that fact, then we are almost certainly in a century where the maritime domain may well be the defining domain. Over the past two years or so, the Chief of Air Force has emphasised the point that Air Force is very much alert to the fact that Australia's strategic context is one that's, in, that's uh, defined by its maritime circumstance. He has, in a number of presentations, laid out the argument regarding Australia's status as a maritime trading nation and the implications of this for an Air Force charged with contributing to the defence of the nation. In fact, I think it's fair to say that all three services have been alive to the fact that our present and future national security concerns are intimately and inextricably connected with the maritime environment and how we project power, both hard and soft, across the seas to protect and preserve our way of life. Today I would like to discuss with you how the RAF sees its role in contributing to the diplomatic initiatives both within, that, within our region and further abroad and to outline the utility of credible, balanced and capable air power in projecting power across the maritime domain. 
To begin, I'm sure that it goes without saying that Air Force and Navy have shared and continue to share a very proud and close history of operating together for nearly a century. The character and form of that interaction and interoperability has changed and evolved over the years, but the spirit of cooperation, shared mutual respect and trust have endured. I see that relationship only growing closer as our capabilities increasingly merge to be a truly joint capability and our mission of shaping and influencing our immediate environment in the cause of providing for national defence grows more closely aligned. But just to cap, recap on a little bit of history first. Air Force's contribution to naval operations has historically been and continues to be realised through the four key air power roles of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, strike, air mobility and control of the air. These roles are enduring and fundamental to air power's contribution to national security and they are terms that we use consistently whenever we speak about air force and air power. The reason for this is because these roles neatly sum up the utility of air power across the spectrum of operations. From humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to high-end warfighting, they encapsulate what air power brings to national security. What's more, they underpin the ways and means that Air Force interacts and operates with Navy. The names we give these roles may have changed over the years, but they reflect the core functions that Air Power has proved or has provided to military operations since military aviation was first developed as a significant form of warfare. From the first control of the air mission launched from the HMA Sydney and Melbourne uh, in Germany's Heli Golan Bight in June of 1918 through to the interwar years where, sea fa uh, where ferry seaplanes were purchased to support RAN reconnaissance operations, air and sea power have cooperated to effectively project military power. Throughout World War II, RAF aircraft flown by a combination of both RAF pilots and Navy observers and gunners escorted our convoys and performed strikes, reconnaissance and surveillance in, in support of both Australian and ally, allied naval task forces. The tradition of Air Force to support the Australian Navy has continued through conflicts in Korea, Vietnam and in the long years of the Cold War. Maritime surveillance and anti-submarine warfare were conducted by Sunderland and Catalina flying boats, Lincoln bombers, Lockheed Neptunes, P-3B and P-3C Orions, and they've been institutionalised elements of RAF tasking for more than 70 years. In addition to these aircraft, along with F-4 Phantoms, F-111 and our Hornets, we've continued to maintain a maritime strike, strike capability, ready con to contribute in any offensive or defensive tasks that the Royal Australian Navy may have been called upon to perform. For much of that history, the focus was on military operations, often in response to contingencies that arose around the globe in which our national interests were somehow involved. Today, as the ADF involvement in Afghanistan begins, begins to draw down, the threat of major conflict appears rather more remote and our focus returns to more local matters. Maritime nations, however, seldom enjoy respite from the relentless task of shaping and influencing the maritime commons upon which we are so vitally dependent. Australia is likewise pressed to be constantly vigilant and prepared to respond. Wars, conflicts, contingencies and international strife are not the only things that can adversely affect the peaceful operation of the maritime domain. Illegal and dangerous activity can jeopardise good conduct at sea. Piracy, illegal fishing, weapons and drug trafficking, trafficking, to name just a few, all threaten to disrupt the efficient and harmonious use of the seas by maritime nations. Humanitarian, humanitarian and natural disasters likewise often call for a response that is, that is either born upon the sea or comes across it. In our region, this has been frequently the case. All of these perturbations demand a response in which diplomacy and power projection of some form through the maritime domain is considered appropriate. Air Force plays a key role in many of these instances and most usually in conjunction with the Navy in a joint effort. What fundamentally shapes the character of our response and perhaps constitutes the single greatest challenge to our national ability to shape and influence our maritime domain is the sheer vastness of that environment. Sitting astride the two great southern hemisphere oceans, bordered to the north by the complex, populous and enormous archipelagic Asian landmass with an extensive exclusive economic zone, Australia has responsibility and interest in a vast maritime domain. 
providing some form of power projection capability across this vastness is a very challenging task and one that again demands a truly joint, integrated and synchronised approach. And the Air Force plays an important role here. It does so through the four key air power roles I alluded to earlier, and I'll now use these roles to highlight the initiatives that Air Force is undertaking and the capabilities that we are acquiring to enhance our ability to project power and to shape and influence our environment in concert, in concert with Navy and Army. If I could go to the next slide, please, if the guys up the back can help. I've only brought one JSF with me today. Turning now then to the specific roles and capabilities that Air Force brings to the maritime environment, I'd like to begin by suggesting that perhaps one of the greatest contributions we make goes to the heart of the challenge of the vastness of our maritime domain, and that is the intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities that we bring to bear. Gaining situational awareness of the operational environment underpins all joint operations, maritime and otherwise and it drives our commitment to deliver timely ISR products specifically through the Jindalee over the horizon radar, the Wedgetail airborne early warning patrol aircraft and our P3 maritime surveillance capabilities. The P8 Poseidon, the planned replacement being acquired under project Air 7000 along with high altitude multi-role unmanned aerial systems will continue to meet the increasing demands for maritime patrol and overwater ISR required for the security of Australia's maritime approaches. Knowing our environment demands that we have the capabilities to sense and report on that environment and through the ISR capabilities we have and having trained through the Defence Capability Plan, Air Force will significantly increase its contribution in this regard. But I hasten to note that this environment is increasingly not just a physical one. The cyber and space domains and our ability to operate our networks in environments that might not offer us trusted information will be especially challenging. While a considerable focus of this conference is on naval diplomacy, and rightly so, we cannot, of course, ignore the most consequential context in which we might have to project power and influence, and that is major warfighting. I agree with the view that the high end of conflict, um, Navy's contribution to the defence of Australia will rely on its ability to control the seas through its capital ships and support vessels. Protection of these naval task force elements will be a priority mission for Air Force and we have long contributed to this task through our maritime strike capability. From our early days with Sunderland flying boats through to the F-111 and with our present Hornets and Super Hornets and the AP-3 we, we have demonstrated this ability to strike. In future highly contested environments what we categorise as anti-access area denial circumstances protection of naval task forces will be critical and challenging. Our ability to conduct anti-service strike in these environments will hinge on comprehensively integrated and harmonised operations, protected networks and potentially integrated air and missile defence and sea tour arrangements whereby Air Force and Navy will have to work hand in hand from concept design to operational employment. It's a big challenge. Anti-submarine warfare has been a mission of the Air Force since World War II and remains so today embodied in our AP-3C fleet. We recognise anti-submarine warfare as a true joint enterprise encompassing the capabilities open to the ADF. Understandably, much of our, intention, much of our attention over recent years has been in the, the Middle East area of operations and on surveillance of our northern approaches which has drawn our focus away from this vital task. We look to revitalise this mission and we see its future involving air warfare destro destroyers, ANZAC, Adelaide class frigates, their embarked MH60 Romeos and Collins class submarines, working with our P3s, our P8s and the maritime unmanned aerial system, networked into a full true joint capability. These assets will be supported by aero refuelling tankers and space-based assets, as well as leveraging the electronic capabilities of the Wedgetail aircraft. The submarine remains a significant threat to our security of a maritime environment, thus our national prosperity. Anti-submarine warfare as a joint endeavour needs to be at the forefront of military priorities if our maritime strategy is to remain relevant. A cornerstone military activity for any operation across the spectrum of conflict is the ability to move people and equipment. The Navy has an unparalleled capacity in our Australian context to move a fighting force across large distances. The size and endurance of its vessels allow, allow the Navy to maintain a presence in the area of operations 
to conduct follow-on combat and sustainment operations. Air mobility through C-17, C-130, our KC-30 multi-role tanker transport and in our future light tactical airlift capability provides Air Force with the ability to move people and equipment across large distances and relatively quickly. Not only do the air power characteristics of speed and reach complement sea power traits of capacity and presence, they can work in harmony to increase the effect effectiveness of the other. Time and again, Air Force and Navy have worked together to deliver the right people to the right place with the right equipment. We've done that in Operation Falconer, uh, working with C-130s and HMAS Manura and Canimbla, where we airlifted uh, during Operation Tsunami, Operation Tsunami Assist in 2005. In addition, Air Mobility has provided logistic support to the Royal Australian Naval vessels all around the globe, whether it be the delivery of critical components to enable repairs, aeromedical evacuations, or just the routine movement of people and equipment. Sea and air power combine, combine to generate the speed, reach, capacity and presence needed to support Australia's national security interests. Control of the air is the cornerstone of all air power effects. We can control portions of the air in time to achieve our, achieve our objectives, like security of sea lines of communication or an area of operation. But we acknowledge that absolute command is neither practical nor usual, usually warranted. Given the scale of our air and sea approaches and the size of our Navy and Air Force, a pragmatic approach to control of the air is necessary. And this is the approach that we have taken. The Navy and the Air Force understand the risk that enemy air action place on shipping, military or commercial, and on our submarines. This is why the Air Force is committed to the Joint Strike Fighter as the most effective control of the air capability to Australia. And Navy is committed to the Air Warfare Destroyer as the most lethal surface combatant Australia can acquire. Air Force's ability to integrate, communicate and operate with all of those systems is a non-negotiable requirement. These capabilities will be even more critical to our ability to operate environments that pose anti-access area denial challenges. Protection of a naval task force from any air, enemy air requires a defence in depth approach and that's just what we'll be looking to do with those combined capabilities in a truly networked sense. The introduction to service of the LHDs Canberra and Adelaide and the LS LSD Chules will provide Australia with an, an important amphibious capability. That will undoubtedly enhance our maritime pro power projection and particularly in contributing to regional diplomacy and support. Air Force will provide a significant contribution to this joint capability. Currently, we're committed to, to uh, embarking airspace controllers and, and air liaison elements onto the LHD. If these vessels were to be deployed in an, in an environment that is contested, the full range of Air Force's control of the air strike, ISR and air mobility capabilities would be required for the protection of the task force and any support for an entry operation. That would be a non-trivial task and will require much more hard work and planning. To conclude, through the key air power roles of ISR strike, air mobility and control of the air, Air Force is continuing to evolve its force to support our national ability to project power through the maritime domain. Every capability Air Force will be bringing online over this next decade will enhance the RAF's contribution to naval activities. From the JSF through to Wedgetail, P8, KC-30, maritime unmanned aerial systems, the Vigil Air Integrated Air Defence C2 system, every emerging Air Force capability will increase our ability to support Royal Australian Navy operations. RAF air power is, is structured for both, both peace and conflict and stands ready to support the full range of Navy's contribution to Australia's national security and prosperity. Australian national security rests on our ability to shape and influence our maritime context. The Navy plays a key role here, finding only increased utility in the present maritime century. An Air Force stands ready to enhance and support that utility and considers, it considers itself firmly on board with Navy in this 21st century. Thank you.